Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming along this evening to the first of our many meetings this year. Uh, we're going to be talking about vision disorders. So we do have a number of guest speakers. Uh, we have Nabil Jacob from Vision Australia. We have uh, Alina Zeldovich, ophthalmologist. We have Annie Gibbons, glaucoma. And we have Professor Mark Gillies. So we have some very professional people to talk to you about a serious problem that is vision and loss of vision. So you'll see on your seats, Vision Australia has left you with some brochures to please uh, have a look at this one, as well as some out the front if you haven't already collected them. Now some housekeeping, very important at this time of the year. Um, one is, please have your phones on silent so we can all enjoy the speakers and uh, people can still send you a message. And I'm Dr. Alan Schell, uh, a long-time board member of the hospital, and I've been with the hospital for over 40 years. With that, and because of the big problem we have this last couple of months, I uh, just want to let you know that the hospital is well prepared for issues around the coronavirus COVID-19. And of course, we're getting lots of questions before people come to hospital about are we going to be well looked after. Well, I can assure you that WALPA is fastidious about its hygiene and quality infection control. But on the other hand, if you're a visitor or you know somebody coming to the hospital who may have been overseas to the number of countries that our department of, or DFAT and others have suggested we should avoid, please stay at home and don't come and visit. Of course, the hospital is well prepared. We don't have a problem like Woolies or Coles and missing out on toilet paper. But on the other hand, we do have, I can assure you, um, a very good regime. We do hand hygiene audits. And for all of us, and there are some gels out the front there, for your protection as well as ours, please consider good hand hygiene as a way to protect yourself. Now, without further ado, we're going to start the evening on vision. Now, for most of you over the age of 55, that's me included, um, we'll have quite a considerable number of issues around vision, including the need to wear glasses when we read or look out the window, etc. And of course, there are other health issues that we get as we sort of climb over the age of 50. There's considered to be about over 400,000 Australians with some form of visual impairment, which accounts for about 10% of the Australians in that group, and that's from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Of course, major eye diseases that cause visual impairment in this community include cataract, a very popular procedure, and Alina will talk about that. That's one of her specialties. Age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, and of course, diabetes affecting the retina. And together with what we call uncorrected refractive errors, uh, that contributes to about 90% of visual impairment amongst we older Australians. So tonight we're going to start off uh, with our first guest is Nabil Jacob from Vision Australia and he's a nice, uh, very good young man who's going to talk about what Vision Australia can do for all of us. Thank you, Nabil. We've had a bit of trouble with our uh, sound system here, so we do apologise. Thank you. I'll hand you over to Nabil. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for coming tonight. Um, tonight I'm going to talk to you about low vision. Um, we have some fantastic medicine in Australia that can pretty much work with a lot of the diseases that people may encounter. But what happens when that disease or medicine or the glasses that you have are the very best? Um, the doctors told you that you're pretty much where you're going to be at and that's the vision you've got remaining. What do you do? How do you keep going? How do you continue living your life? How do you watch TV? How do you cook? How do you still get to uh, bowls? How do you um, socialise? So they're the sorts of things I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. Okay. okay, so a little bit about Vision Australia. We're the leading national provider of low vision services. We support people of all ages, so from newborns right through to the elderly. Um, we work in partnership with you with what you may want to do if you, your vision is low or you've lost your sight, what is it that you want to still be able to achieve? And when I say you've lost your sight, it, you don't have to be blind to the point where you need a cane or a dog. You may have just lost your driver's license, so your vision's still pretty good, 
but not good enough to drive a car. That in itself can be a little bit traumatic um, and we're really ready to help you from that point on, especially if the doctor has told you your disease may progress and become worse uh, with time. So please don't feel that low vision services are solely for people who need a dog or a cane or can't see very well. It's even for people whose vision has um, reduced to that point. Um, our key focus then is on independence, employment, education and inclusion. Um, we have 800 staff um, in 30 offices across Australia. Um, we have about 3,500 volunteers, so we thank our volunteers for all their help. We see about 27,000 clients a year. Um, of those 27,000 clients, about 3,000 we've seen through from birth, right through to school, um, technical college, university to work. So we do follow people as they progress. Um, and collectively, we have about 150 years of experience in low vision and blindness. Some of you may remember us as the Royal Blind Society here in New South Wales. Well, we all amalgamated about 17 years ago, a lot of the East Coast um, providers, and that's where Vision Australia stems from. And our head office is now in Melbourne, Victoria. But we do have offices here in Sydney. Parramatta is our head office in New South Wales, uh, Ashfield, uh, Caringba and Epping. Okay. Okay, so the common eye conditions that you're going to come across, and there are a few of them were mentioned today. So in the top left-hand corner is normal vision. Um, you have age-related macular degeneration next to it in the middle, um, and diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma at the bottom on the left, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, and cataract. So they'll give you an indication of this, the sort of vision you might have um, with a moderate or severe um, form of that disease. Um, if you have any questions later on, please feel free to ask. We will be taking questions. Okay, so the sorts of things vision will impact on, as I mentioned at the outset, how do you go home and cook, put makeup on or shave, um, socialise? You're twice as likely to fall. Um, so falls risk is a big issue for people with vision loss. How do you keep reading and keep in touch with friends and news? You may become isolated because you're too scared to leave the house and become depressed catching transport, driving, how do you use your computer or your phone? You used to play sport, you used to do recreational activities, you're too scared, so how do you continue doing those? We can help with all of those. So the increased um, risks that you have with vision loss, you, as I mentioned, you're twice as likely to fall, um, you're three times more likely to fall into depression, and yes, unfortunately, that does, for a very small percentage of our clients, reach suicide levels, especially with our younger clients who lose their vision at an early age. Um, you're four to eight times more likely to break a hip. Um, and as we know, that's already a high incidence with the elderly population. You're more likely to enter assisted living three to five years earlier than you otherwise would have. And your socialization decreases by about half. So you stop doing most of the things that you like doing. Okay, so some of the things, questions that you might ask yourself that, you've, that may indicate you have vision loss and questions you'd, 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 you'd pose. How are you going um, seeing TV or reading? Has anything changed there? Are your lights bright enough for you in your house? Do you miss the cup when making a cup of coffee or tea with the hot water? Have you burnt your hand? Um, how, do you get a, how do you go and get about? How do you go shopping? How do you go to the supermarket, to the library, um, to the club? How do you find social situations? Do you feel awkward when someone puts a plate of food in front of you and you can't really eat it because you don't really know what's there on the plate and where it is and it goes everywhere? Um, is there anything that you used to do, and this is the most important one, that your vision is now stopping you from doing? Once again, we can help. Okay, so the goals that we would have for somebody with vision loss is for you to stay safe at home, um, Remain independent so you can do as much as you possibly can on your own without requiring assistance and we can help you learn skills, strategies, aids and equipment to be able to do all of that. Um, remain social. Um, picture up here of June, one of our real life clients lost her vision um, from age related macular degeneration, wanted to continue ballroom dancing. So you know what? We helped her stay ballroom dancing. So it gets to that point where there's pretty much nothing we can't help you do other than maybe driving a car. Okay, so the services that Vision Australia has put together, when I said we amalgamated about 17 years ago, we created a one-stop shop so that you don't 
didn't need to go anywhere. So once you walk into one of our 30 offices, we're able to provide all of these services, which you have the brochure uh, for, and we're able to pretty much meet all the needs of, the, of clients. You'll notice that we also do dogs. Uh, we, we have Seeing Eye Dogs Australia. A lot of you may be familiar with Guide Dogs, which is another fantastic organisation. They're not part of Vision Australia, but they are also an, a fantastic organisation. But if you see Seeing Eye Dogs Australia, that's um, Vision Australia. So you can read through those services um, in your brochure uh, in your own time. Okay, so the sorts of ways we actually physically help you, you can get an electronic magnifier that you can carry around and you can take pictures. Um, you can read your medicine, take it to the supermarket, ingredients, use by dates. We can help you in the kitchen to remain cooking with talking microwaves, talking fridges, talking scales, um, contrast and brightness. We can set up your, um, your dining situation so that you can see when you're eating. Um, we can help you catch a bus there at the bottom left-hand corner, um, train you how to do that, how to get on the bus safely, how to know which bus to catch, um, finding a seat, sitting down. Um, in the bottom middle corner, our, our client there has a, what we call a daisy player, and she can access hundreds of thousands of different journals and articles, newspapers, and they're fed Wi-Fi, um, so she can remain in touch with what's going on, from a Mills and Boone's novel to the New York Times. Um, we can download it for you and you can join that library free. Um, and as you saw, June here who wanted to um, keep ballroom dancing. So technology's come a long way. So what we have in the top left-hand corner is a device called the Iris Vision. Now, if you're somebody, for example, that has macular degeneration and the centre part of your vision is gone and all you can use is your side vision, this will help you magnify that side vision to a point where you can start to make things out. So you may be wanting to watch a, a grandson or a child play soccer or football or a concert, go to a place of worship, come to a theatre like this, and you'll be able to magnify that peripheral field of view or your side vision to a point where you can make it out. And also for things up close, so if you do woodwork or you're cooking, um, it will definitely help you do that. We have phones that are very simple to use, large screen. Um, we're able to give you TV magnifiers, and the modern ones now will actually read what's under it. So you place a book under it and it will project it onto a screen and you're able to do that work um, with a very magnified um, screen. And you're able to control how large that is, whether it's colour, black and white, etc. Or something very simple like a, a beautician would use or a doctor may use, a magnifier that's on a stand with a light in it that helps you read um, and do things and, and keeps both hands free so you're not having to hold up a magnifier. Now, technology's come a long way, and excuse me, the sounds are not working here, but I'm going to play a quick video just to show you where technology has um, taken us. Text reading. A large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses growing on it were white, but there were three garden. Face recognition. Jane. Money notes detection. $50. Product identification. Oatmeal square cinnamon. Barcode. Sausalito cookies, 7.2 ounce bag. Color detection. Gray area. Telling time and date. The time is 6.13 p.m. Today is Wednesday, July 19, 2017. So you can see technology has come a long way and we have all of this equipment available so that if it's something that 
is uh, suitable for you, we will definitely help you um, attain it. Okay, so you're gonna ask me, how much does all of this cost? How do you get a referral to our services? Anybody can refer. You can self-refer, you can refer a family member. More likely, if you're in a disease state, your ophthalmologist or your optometrist, um, or maybe even their orthoptist will refer you and tell you about Vision Australia services. And how is it paid for? So the vast majority of our clients are on made aged care, sorry, my aged care, if they're over 65. If they're under 65, the NDIS will cover um, a lot of our services and equipment that you've seen this evening, or some of our clients choose to self-fund. Um, we will help you do all the paperwork for the NDIS. We are logged into the My Aged Care portal so that if you are on a package, we can definitely access part of that for vision services and equipment. And the other thing is, please don't be afraid. You don't need to come to one of our offices. We can come to you. Just give us a call. The 1300 number is there on your brochure and um, we will take care of everything for you. So it's not gonna be a painful um, experience at all. All right, so we're gonna leave questions to the end. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to um, John again. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nabil. Yes, as always, we have questions at the end. We'll invite our panelists to sit down and let you have question time. So, our Our next uh, guest speaker is Dr. Alina Zeldovich. She's a Macquarie Street ophthalmologist specialising in complex cataract surgery, particularly for people with other complicating eye conditions, such as macular degeneration and glaucoma. Uh, she's a fellow of the uh, College of Ophthalmologists and the Honorary Secretary New South Wales branch. She's obviously uh, written quite a number of papers and is a clinical lecturer at Sydney University Medical School, um, as well as being a wife and a mother good wife to one of our board members. Good evening. Uh, so I'd like to invite Alina to come and speak to us about advances in eye health and cataract surgery. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I just would like to draw your attention to that little, oh, it's cut off. Okay. It says 2020, the year of the eye. And as you know, 2020 in America is like having 6-6 six, six vision. And so the aim for this year is to optimise everybody's vision across the board. Okay. So firstly, the eyes are a part of the brain. So they're a neural tissue and the things that happen within the brain can also happen within the eye. If you lose neural tissue, as in the brain and the eye, that tissue is irreparable. So um, I just wanted to briefly describe the anatomy of the eye to you so that you understand where various diseases occur. And the beauty of the eye being a transparent structure is the only structure in the body where you can actually see the blood vessels as well as the nerves directly. So the front part of the eye is called the cornea and that's the front glassy surface. So if you see um, the person next to you and you look at them side on, that's the first part that you see. And that's where you can have trauma, where you wear contact lenses and where we, do cataract, where we can do um, surgery to remove glasses in the younger age group. Behind that and the colour part, which is called the iris, is the anterior chamber. And that is the part of the eye uh, where we measure the intraocular pressure and the angle where we can treat the structures for glaucoma. Behind the iris is the lens. And in a normal um, young person, that lens is very flexible. It's suspended by little ligaments in the eye and it sits in a bag of its own. And if we want to focus on something up close, we can do that. But unfortunately, as we get older in our late 30s, early 40s, we lose that ability and that's called presbyopia. And that is also where cataracts occur. Behind that again, we have a fluid gel called the vitreous and behind that is the retina. And the retina, if you like, is like the film in the old cameras. It literally takes a picture of the um, world outside and then that is transmitted by the optic nerve to the brain where it's interpreted as a picture, as an image. 
The optic disc is the end of that big optic nerve that travels from the brain to the eyeball and we can directly see that when we look in. The macula, where macular degeneration occurs, is the sweet spot, the centre of the retina and that's the part that we use to recognise faces and use our central vision. So when we talk about visual disorders, in general, as an ophthalmologist, we talk about visual disorders as things that are not corrected by glasses. And we can divide them into things that will cause you symptoms. So you'll come in and you'll complain, I've got decreased vision, or I've got flashes or floaters, or my, my, my eye is sticky or gunky. Um, and the things that we commonly see presenting like that are your conjunctivitis, blepharitis, which is inflammation around the eyelids, dry eye, uh, trauma, and cataract and macular degeneration. Then there's a category of disease which is asymptomatic. So it doesn't cause you as a patient any symptoms and things like glaucoma and diabetes fall into that category. And then there are a few other disorders which actually cause you visual symptoms but the eye is not the one that's responsible. It's coming from the brain. So... I'm sure you're all very familiar with how, to, how we treat eye diseases and our go-to is what's happening to this kitten is using drops. But it's very important if you're going to use drops to use the correct drop technique. And double dot is the technique that we recommend. So it's the digital occlusion technique and don't open technique. So whenever you put an eye drop in, these are sterile substances and you have to make sure you don't touch the eyelashes or the eyeball or the eyelid when you're instilling the eye drop. Once the eye drop goes in, it's very important to just close your eye and gently rest your eye for two minutes. And once you're doing that, you also push over the corner of the eye here to prevent the drop going into your general circulation. So if you take one, uh, one take-home message from this talk, if that's it, that would be really good. Because that, what that does is it improves um, the drug and its effectivity on the eye and it also stops it from getting into the general circulation through the blood vessels in your nose. The other way that we um, can treat eyes is with laser. And we use laser a lot in ophthalmology. We can laser the iris, the colour part, uh, to relieve angle closure. We can laser the angle as a treatment for glaucoma. It's called SLT laser. We use it for cataract, for cornea, and also we can use it in the retina. Intravitreal injections are uh, treatments for wet macular degeneration. I'm sure that Mark Gillies will talk to you more about that. We can use implants uh, for dry eye. We can use plugs. In cataract surgery, I use implants all the time. We also can use them to deliver medications within the retina. And the... Um, most advances have actually taken place in the glaucoma field with the minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And on the slide there, which is being cut off, unfortunately, is a tiny little implant. It's kind of the size of the white of your pinky nail and that goes into the angle of the eye and it works like a little stent and it reduces the intraocular pressure. So my personal passion is cataract. So there's a picture there of cataract of what we see when we dilate the pupils. And obviously these are pretty advanced cases. So the cataract once again occurs deep within the eye, behind the iris. And it's your natural lens that you're born with, which is nice and clear and soft and flexible, has become um, frosty or misty. And that results in a loss of transparency. So the vision and the visual quality is blurry and glary. Sometimes you can also get a change in the power. So you might notice that you're really having to change your glasses quite often. And occasionally, because the cataract increases the power within the eye, you might find your reading vision all of a sudden is great, better than when you're in your 30s, 40s, but the distance vision is dropping off. So the things that I want to know is what sort of things do you like to do and you can't do and are those related to cataract? So did you used to drive at night and now you're worried about glare and blur when you go out and you've stopped driving because you're no longer comfortable? Uh, did you used to play golf and now you don't have the confidence to play golf because your distance vision has reduced? 
Um, I, I'm interested in what sort of glasses that you're wearing because if you haven't had your glasses updated recently, that's a pretty easy non-invasive thing uh, to do prior to going on and having cataract surgery. Any um, previous history of eye conditions is really important. In particular, if you've ever had any other eye surgery or you've got macular degeneration or any other eye conditions. And I'm also interested in your medical history. Uh, in particular, diabetes, have you got any immune disorders and what medications are you taking? So anticoagulants, it's pretty obvious. They're things like your Cartier, Plavix, um, Warfarin, and they can increase your risk of bleeding. Um, diabetic medication, steroids can increase the pressure in the eye. But one thing that people are not so aware of is the medications that are used for prostatic hypertrophy. And they're very common and they're, they're like your Flomaxtra or your Duodart. So these medications cause a problem intraoperatively. It's called floppy iris syndrome, where the iris can behave very erratically and it increases your risk uh, during cataract surgery of complications. So if you are on these medications, it's really important to let your surgeon know that you're taking one of those medications and we can make modifications to make the operation safe for you. In fact, the, Amer uh, the American Academy has um, put out recommendations that if you have cataracts and you are considering starting one of those medications, it's a good idea to have the cataracts attended to first. So when I look at the cataract, I want to know what the vision is in the distance, how it measures in the near, and then um, what it's like with your best correction, with your best glasses on. And then you may have noticed when you come into our office, we use a pinhole. And what the pinhole does, it's a universal lens. So it's as if we had put some fantastic um, updated glasses in front of your eye, and it just concentrates those very... Um, central beams of light that directly hit the macula, the sweet spot of the eye. We have a look at the front of the eye, measure the pressure in the eye, and then we have to dilate the pupils. So when you have your pupils dilated, your vision is blurry after that for a few hours, and we check the back of the eye. And when I look in, this is what I see. So this is obviously for study purposes, but this top row is nuclear cataract, and that's a side-on view. And you can see as we progress, the nucleus of the lens is getting um, more and more yellow. And that's why some people will complain that the colours are not quite right. And once they have the cataract surgery, they can see the blues um, afterwards. The cortical cataract, which is the next one we're looking at front on, and that's the type of cataract you might get with more UV exposure. And that um, bottom row there is the posterior subcapsular cataract, which is more common in people who use steroids and also in diabetic patients. And some people have a combination of all of these cataracts. So when you come in, we do a whole lot of tests. And the reason why we're doing those tests is really to exclude that you don't have any other diseases within the eye that could preclude you from getting a really good result. And so that we can counsel you properly and plan the surgery. And we need to also plan, when I take the cataract out, about what sort of implant I'm going to put in the eye once the cataract comes out. And so you can see some of those uh, examples of the scans that we do to work that out. So there are lots of intraocular lenses on the market. There are new ones coming out every few months. Um, and there, there are many, many choices. But having said that, the most common intraocular lens is a monofocal lens. So it's a lens that's usually focused nicely for the distance. Um, and we can also correct astigmatism with that. So astigmatism is a condition where instead of the eye being nice and um, round like a soccer ball, it's more like a football shaped. And so we have to correct the powers along the different meridians um, by rotating the lens in a particular location for you. There are also multifocal lenses, which have a number of different focal points. And there are extended depth of focus lenses, which have a range of focal points. So 
One of the ways to do cataract surgery is using a laser, and that's called laser-assisted cataract surgery, and it is a pre-treatment, and you can see um, us lining the patient up here under the laser, and it's appropriate for some people. And what the laser does is it creates um, a hole in the bag, which is what that purple line is there, and then it pre-softens the cataract. And that's what those little um, cubes that you can see in the green light and it's quite safe and effective and it's, it's good for certain situations. Afterwards, we still need to take people into the operating room to actually remove the cataract. And that's done by a technique called phacoemulsification. The wounds are very, very small. They're around two millimetres. So the cataract is broken up within the eye using um, almost like a little jackhammer that jackhammers the cataract, which is the consistency of a pebble into some paste and then that can be um, sucked out of the eye. And through that incision, we put in a new lens. I had some videos, but I, I won't play them. <laughs> so what are the results like? The results are excellent um, if you don't have anything else going on with your eye. So more than 90% of patients will get 6.6 or better. That's 2020 in the American. And 95% will get 6.7.5 or better. And um, with the monofocal lenses, you still will need glasses for certain tasks unless you have monovision, which uh, is where one eye is for distance and one eye is for near, and then your glass, you may be less glasses independent. The extended depth of focus lenses can be used in people who have some diseases, but the multifocal ones really are only very good if you have an absolutely pristine optical system that has nothing else. But having said that, cataract surgery is to remove the disease process of cataract. It is not to remove glasses. So all of these refractive options are really, you know, the cheering on the icing on the cake. So in reality, most people who like multifocal glasses will tend to go back into multifocal glasses. And as we've already heard from Nabil's talk, uh, the real benefit of cataract surgery is increased long-term survival because you decrease your risk of falls and terminal vents like um, hip fractures. So things that you can do for your eyes today. So firstly, you can eat a well-balanced diet with lots of different coloured veggies, green leaf, leafy vegetables. I've got a picture there of some examples. They're kale and spinach and things like that. And eat um, fish two to three times a week and it doesn't have to be fresh fish it can be fish from a can you can consider some supplements um, if your diet is not adequate and if you have specific changes Mark Gillies will probably address that and protect your eyes from UV eye damage and um, Beamers is uh, maximally protective sunglasses that I developed with a colleague of mine Dr Chanel Sharma a pediatric ophthalmologist and we know that UV causes um, skin cancers around the eyelid, growths on the eyeball, as well as some forms of cataract. And so we encourage you to protect yourself and protect your kids. There's some flyers if anyone's interested. If you use the WALPA 10 code, you'll get a discount and all proceeds will go to Glaucoma Australia that Annie will tell you about in the next talk. Make sure you control your cardiovascular risk factors like blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar and limit your steroids, all the things that cardiologists are telling you about all the time. And most importantly, don't smoke. So in summary, have a healthy and well-balanced lifestyle. Enjoy your brain, enjoy your eyes, enjoy all your activities, eat nutritious food and make sure you get your regular eye checks in there somewhere. Thank you very much, Alina. So equally uh, nice young lady, Annie Gibbons, from, is the CEO of Glaucoma Australia. Annie uh, has been involved with Glaucoma Australia in uh, helping to manage a very good charity to make a difference in reducing preventable eye disease uh, for many thousands of Australians. And besides that, she's uh, a mother of two sets of twins. Plus one. Plus one, yeah, so there you go. Oh, Ruthie's a twin as well, there you go. 
Okay, so Annie's going to talk about how Glaucoma Australia works to improve the quality of life for people living with glaucoma. Let me just get everybody to stand up and have a bit of a shake. Come on, get up and a bit of a wriggle. Come on, that's a bit of dancing and waking. That's it. That's the way. Okay. You can all sit down now and relax. Technology. Alina's technology worked a lot better than this. There we go. Down here. Yes. Okay, over to Annie. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody, and it's a delight to come and share with you tonight from Glaucoma Australia. And, uh, yes, I did have two sets of twins in 26 months, so there you go. Uh, they've survived anyway. They're now young adults, which is adorable. Uh, so tonight, uh, along the theme of vision disorders, I'm going to tell you how Glaucoma Australia works to improve the quality of life for people living with glaucoma. That's what we're about. And so when we look at Australia, we actually have at least 300,000 people with glaucoma and we have this really strange scenario that we've got 50% of them who remain undetected. It's kind of a strange thing that how could 50% of people, 150,000 people, be walking around today and not know they have a potentially blinding eye disease? And so our mission at Glaucoma Australia is to eliminate this preventable but irreversible blindness, to find these people early. And uh, so I'll share why that happens throughout this presentation. So the scenario is that if you look at the... 50% who are diagnosed and 50% who are undiagnosed, you'll sort of see this scenario happening. For the people who are diagnosed, the people who have glaucoma, of which there may be some people here tonight, around half of them, good patients, that's what we'd call them, that's what our two doctors would say, they're going to be people who are diagnosed, they've been told they've got glaucoma, they go into their appointments regularly, they take their treatment. They're what we call fully adherent or compliant patients. We then have the other 50% of them who go, I know I've got glaucoma, but you know what? I prefer not to or I find it ex you know, expensive. Do I really want to spend money on drops and laser and bits and pieces? Do I, can I get to the ophthalmologist? I've got sort of stuff that hinders me, if you like. So we'll say they're not fully adherent. And the strange thing is the stats are around 36 to 50% of people within 12 months of diagnosis are not taking their medication properly which is astounding, isn't it? Because nine out of ten people, if you surveyed them in Australia, would say, my sight is my most important sense. In fact, many people surveyed would actually say, I'd rather die or have a limb cut off than lose my sight. That's how important it is. So it's a strange thing. For those people who are undiagnosed, we know that up to 50% of them have a risk factor. It's ten times more likely if you have a relative with glaucoma to have glaucoma. So that's an easy one to say. If you're at primary risk, if you've got a relative with glaucoma, go and get your eyes tested. And then we have other risk factors. We know that if you're of African or Asian origin, uh, that you could have glaucoma, you use steroids, uh, you're ageing. It basically increases quite significantly, maybe 1 in 200 at 40, but maybe up to 1 in 8 80 year olds So it is also an ageing disease. And then we have the people, the 25% of people who go, I don't have a relative, I don't think I have a risk factor, but I will have glaucoma. So they're the hardest ones, if you like, to find. 
So I think of myself as the patient, as the CEO of a patient-centred organisation, why shouldn't I? And I've now just turned 52, so at 50, I was eye health aware. You know, I was originally a registered nurse, I'm, I know all about health prevention, why wouldn't I automatically go and get my eyes tested? And as the CEO of this charity, of course, I want to make sure that I'm all about saving sight. And it's pretty easy if you think about it. We need to detect people early and we need to defeat the blindness that could occur. So therefore, two easy tasks. Because if I'm the patient and I am that patient, because my grandfather had glaucoma, my dad possibly had, he died early of a brain tumour, and I went and had my eyes tested at 50, and I thought, if I come out here now, I'm going to be a good patient. Why would I want to go blind? I'm going to be a happy, healthy. I'm definitely the candidate to be in the top 25%. And I also think, well, wouldn't it be a no-brainer if I went and got diagnosed? Wouldn't every person who touches me as the patient, as in the ophthalmologist, optometrist, pharmacist, you know, GP, orthoptist, anyone in the eye health community, they should automatically go, hey, if you've got glaucoma, you need to be supported. You need to be referred to Glaucoma Australia because they're here to, here to help you as the patient. And then, of course, I meet these gorgeous patients along the way, part of Glaucoma Australia, and they go, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. I could have lost my sight. People like Gayla, who then says things like glaucoma awareness, early detection, is, uh, and a strong understanding about glaucoma, of course, is, is helping me save my sight. But they're unfortunately, as I've just shared, not the majority of people. We've got so many people out there who are diagnosed and are not doing the right thing or actually haven't been found yet. And so we need to focus our time on them because, once again, they're the dream patients, people like Gayla. But if this was me, I could be going, oh, my gosh, I've been diagnosed. I've just been told I've got a blinding eye disease but I have no symptoms. As um, was referred to by uh, Dr. Zeldovich, you could actually have a slow ongoing progression of your peripheral vision loss and you go, you could actually lose up to 40% of vision without actually noticing it. So it sounds perplexing. And many people now go to Dr. Google, they go to a friend, go, do you think it's really legit? And will I spend money and time on worrying about this? And of course they should because we also have those people who cry on the phone at Glaucoma Australia that they were diagnosed 10 years ago, didn't take it seriously and now they've actually just been told that they've lost maybe up to half of their sight and they can't get that back. And that's just a terrible, terrible scenario. But I understand it. And so our job is as a patient-centred organisation to actually appreciate. It sounds really weird. It sounds very difficult. But because of these reasons, you know, you're going to have to trust us, trust the information we give you and help you through. Then we also need to know for those undiagnosed, this is why we have awareness campaigns. This is why we have risk awareness. This is why on Sunrise this morning, Kirk Pangilly, who's a rock star, he's got glaucoma. He was on Sunrise for us this morning. He's in the media helping us this week. Next week we'll have the Governor-General, who's a patron of Glaucoma Australia. They're all out there telling you if you are at risk, there's a few known risks go and get your eyes tested. In fact, if you're over 50, just get in the habit of going and get your eyes tested. Because Glaucoma Australia want to do basically five things. We want to improve your adherence. We want to say if you're diagnosed and you're on treatment, not just for glaucoma, by the way, for any health disorder, if you have been prescribed medication or suggested that by a health professional, just do what they say. So we call that appointment adherence and treatment adherence. Go to your appointments and take the treatment. We empower people. We know that people are more likely to do this. We improve their knowledge. So we're all into knowledge, um, increasing their knowledge. We're into reducing their anxiety. And people are less anxious when they know why they're doing what they're doing. So we do quite a lot of emotional health, which improves their quality of life. And we do a massive campaign on family testing because if you're up to 50% likely to have glaucoma because you've got a relative, well, why wouldn't we target you first? 
So I won't go into these um, slides very much because they'll be referred to by our other presenters, but people will present with different symptoms. If you heard Kirk Pengilly on the on the um, on sunrise this morning, he had angle closure, so he had a medical emergency. You know, he had a severe loss from a, a more of a rarer kind of glaucoma. And so for him, it was like, I can't see, I have incredible pain, I can hardly open my eyes, I need to have emergency treatment. But 90% of people will actually have a slowly progressive loss that they'll refer to in a variety of different ways. And as Nabil referred to, it's going to start once you have vision loss affecting all areas of your life. I thought I'd show you this slide. I'll just see if that... Oh, it's not going to work now because I don't have the clicker. Okay. Um, mm. Well, I'll just see if that... No, not to worry. Um, what these slides were going to show you is that... When you go and get your eyes tested, some of you might have had, um, it's called a visual field test and you actually get to say, click the button when you see dots or don't do dots and you feel like you're in this game. In fact, many people go, I feel like I'm set up to fail. Do I really um, know what's happening here? Oh, it is working a little bit. And so what happens is the when you're doing that test, what, that black bit at the top of the screen, that's the visual field and it's basically all these little black dots are sort of forming and so it's actually showing that your vision is clouding. But when you're doing a task like, you know, being in the kitchen, um, doing a crossword, um, walking down a flight of stairs, for example, or driving, your visual field, if you did a test on it, it could be clouding over, bits of, bits are missing, but you don't know that until it's maybe 50% gone. And so these sorts of tests are actually very interesting to see that, and they prove to people when we're trying to improve their knowledge why things, if you're in the kitchen, things could actually just disappear as that darkness starts happening, like on the slide, you can see that the darkness happens before the clouding over actually occurs. All right, so this is our risk awareness campaign. As I said before, we have, um, we, we've gone and targeted major risk areas such as an African Asian eye, ageing or family link. So you'll see our green campaign and we've brought out the big guns. We've got the Governor General as patron and he'll be presenting with us next week. We've got Kirk Pengilly all over the media and we've actually got an army of fantastic ophthalmologists, optometrists, pharmacists, eye health professionals all around the country who are actually working together with Glaucoma Australia. It's a fantastic profession in the way that everyone's aligned on what we need to do. Our strategy is very clear. We have programs at Glaucoma Australia that are very, very clear. If it was you or if you were sitting here today going, I have glaucoma, you go to the Glaucoma Australia website, you just join up for free and you'll automatically be put through a four-stage program and supported. And we do that deliberately because it's really overwhelming. You don't want to be diagnosed today and suddenly Googling videos on eye surgery. It's not necessary. You don't want to be getting yourself alarmed by things that really um, are not where you're at at the moment. Most importantly, if you were stage one and just got told you might have glaucoma today, you actually need to just be told to go to the appointment to go and see Dr Zeldovich or whoever you've been referred to. Because do you know what? Up to a third of people at the moment on our stats were never going to go. Isn't that incredible? They just decided, oh, that's wrong, I don't have time for this, I don't want to hear the answer, whatever the reason is. So we are very focused and we give them advice on what to ask and to, why it's worth their while. If it was stage two and they've just been diagnosed, we want to spend 100% of our time on what treatment were you on and we talk through that. So like Alina was talking about, how do you put in eye drops? How does that work? You know, if you've never done that before, that's really, you know, um, frustrating, scary, um, tricky and so we want to help you through that and we've got lots of videos and things like that. If it's stage three, it means you're six months down the track and it's pretty tricky when you decide, oh my gosh, am I going to have this for life? 
This revelation happens somewhere around five to six months that you go, I've changed from having an acute situation to a chronic situation and I've really got to get myself into good practices like you would with any other situation. And then most of our time, of course, is spent with living with glaucoma, which is a bit of what Nabil talked about before. We help people with a million different questions that they have. Can they go skydiving? Can they do yoga? Should they wear swimming goggles? What's happening with my diet? You know, should I have extra vitamins? Do you think my ophthalmologist is right? Right. Should I ask a second opinion? The questions go on and on. The great thing is that we are making an impact. We've had 6,000 people come through our Glaucoma Australia in the last year and everything, which is just incredible. It's really encouraging, not that there's so many people, but that we are actually now connecting with people and we know that the evidence will show us that the earlier we connect with them, the better. The old days were you wait till someone really, really needs you and has loss, great loss, and then they need emotional support. That's not going to save sight. It's not actually where we should be. We should be there from the very first day someone is diagnosed. If that was me, I want to be getting maximum support from day one. I'd rather be told I've got one or two percent of vision loss. And if I'm supported 100% and do everything right, I might end up with 10% vision loss, but you know what? It won't affect my life. I'll be able to just get on with it, live my life happy and healthy with a health condition and how many of us have a condition of some kind. So it is actually a hopeful message. We are making a difference. We are having targeted campaigns to make sure that we need, we reach these people who are currently undiagnosed. And so if that's you today, the take-home message is if you haven't had your eyes tested, it's free, bulk build, go and find yourself a local optometrist ask for a glaucoma test. At the same time, they'll check you for macular disease and also diabetic retinopathy. So it's a comprehensive test and uh, hopefully you won't have glaucoma, but if you do, get supported very early. So thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. Well, we certainly got the message. Uh, very important disease to pick up because it's one of the major ones and the other one we're going to talk about now is technology yes about to Sorry. about to get there so we have professor of retinal therapeutics professor mark gillies uh, who is involved in director research at the save site institute at the university of sydney and is considered as a clinician scientist who specializes in disease around the macula, as uh, Alina gave us a wonderful bit of anatomy lesson there, I think that the uh, that part of the eye and my mother had that um, disease. If you treat it well, then you keep your eyesight for a lot longer and you see better. So we're going to talk about how to avoid going blind from macular degeneration. Professor Mark Gillies, please. Thank you, Alan. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So. How to avoid going blind from age-related macular degeneration. How do I get yeah, how do I get this going? Uh, yeah. All right, so the short answer is eat kale and die young. <clears throat> and that really is a take-home message. Um, Age-related macular degeneration, the main risk factor is being above 50 years old. It doesn't occur in younger age groups. It used to be called senile macular degeneration, but we changed that when we all started getting senile ourselves and <clears throat> age-related. And as I'll show you, it increases exponentially with age. And the reason we're seeing so much of it now is that we've just pushed the average lifespan to 80 years old and that's when people start to get it. And the second one is eat kale. So Alina really went through the routine advice for looking after your eyes and most of this is directed towards treating or preventing age-related macular degeneration, the dietary advice. Leafy green vegetables in particular have been shown repeatedly to have a protective effect in the entire population. 
brightly colored vegetables such as squash, um, uh, anything that's yellow, egg yolks, uh, uh, can, not too much, but they can be good for you. And uh, finally, fish two or three times a week. And everyone should do that. There's not a lot else you can do apart from getting your eyes checked uh, from when you're around 50 years old, which is the first one you'd want to have a look at for macular degeneration, and thereafter every two to five years, depending on what's found at that examination. So I'll talk a bit about the vitamins, which tend to be overused, uh, and some other things that we're doing uh, around the world in the Safe Site Institute uh, about new treatments. We can finish with that. Um, also, the one thing we can do is treat advanced wet macular degeneration with macular bleeds, but we still have no treatment for the atrophy, the dry degeneration, uh, where you get uh, atrophy in the macula. So I won't dwell on this, but again, this is a very common disease. Around 250,000 people in Australia can have it, and around 85,000 people at the moment in Australia are receiving injections for this wet or near vascular macular degeneration characterised by bleeding. <clears throat> so essentially it is a condition of the macula, the centre of the retina, as Alina mentioned, and you find these drusen, which I understand is German for crystals. They're these yellow things I'll show you, and some changes in the retinal pigment epithelium, which is a, a pigmented layer of cells uh, which supports the retina at the base, and it's like the, uh, the black curtain the old photographers used to have. It stops the light bouncing around and it supports the retina. And the late forms, as I said, are either bleeding, which we can treat, or the dry form, the atrophic form, which we cannot. So here's an eye with early age-related macular degeneration. It's quite impressive, but you would expect this person to have normal vision, despite all these uh, drusen that you can clearly see. And whilst this eye is at risk for uh, loss of vision, this eye may go for another 10 or 20 years with normal vision. Here's some late uh, macular degeneration now. On your left, you can see the subretinal blood around the central abnormal vessel. You can't see the, tube, the tubes of a vessel, but there's a, an abnormal pancake-shaped mass of blood vessels there invading the macula. That's what we treat with the injections. On your right, uh, it's not all that easy to see, especially if you've got age-related macular degeneration, but my arrow is going around a circular area here, which is a zone of atrophy. The, the outer retina uh, has disappeared in this eye, and we cannot replace that. If that gets into the centre here, then you will lose your central vision. It's a very slow process. The, uh, the bleeding occurs very quickly, and you can lose the vision in weeks, but um, the atrophy, the dry degeneration on the right there, takes many years before it affects central vision. So here's some changes you can see um, from the Blue Mountains Eye Study, one of the world's great um, epidemiological surveys of eye disease done out in the Blue Mountains by Paul Mitchell. So on the top here, there's a 65-year-old a woman who has a bit of debris, a bit of drusen, we also call it debris, um, and five years later she's got a lot more, but would still be seeing normally and would probably not even know there was anything wrong. On the bottom here, you've got a one-year course of someone with some background drusen on the left, and then she, they've had a big bleed here, and that's turned into a scar. And uh, once you get a scar in the macula, you, we can't treat that either. So what will you find, what do you get with macular degeneration? Uh, you may notice nothing. Uh, obviously, the most common symptom is some sort of decrease or blurred vision. Um, we have these words we use to confuse people. Scotoma is just a blind spot. So if there's a spot in your vision you can't see, we call that a scotoma. And then if you get distortion of your vision, that's a very significant symptom, but we call that metamorphopsia. Uh, distortion occurs from anything that distorts the surface of the macula. So it just might be the drusen in which case you don't worry about it because they won't cause progressive loss of vision. But what we do worry about is an abnormal blood vessel growing in and leaking and causing the macula to swell up. That will also cause distortion, and that needs to be treated as soon as possible. 
So there's distortion uh, is a very important symptom. And obviously, you'll only see it from one eye. So if you do have macular degeneration, you're worried about it, you should check the vision in each eye because if you only check, you're looking at both eyes at the same time, you probably won't pick up early distortion. You don't want to do it too much because if you have a lot of degeneration, even a high risk person might only have a 10% risk of a bleed per year, but you have to check each eye individually. So what about if you get this wet macular degeneration? We'll talk about that now. Um, what happens to you, or well, back in the day, 15 years ago, before you had the injections and the treatments weren't very good? Well, people will lose one line in the chart at three months and four lines at two years. But essentially, 80% of people after two years with untreated wet macular degeneration will be what's called legally blind. They may still see to get around, but they haven't got their, uh, their central vision. It's the complete opposite of glaucoma where you've got your central but not the peripheral. In macular degeneration, you have the peripheral but not the central. So you can't drive, you can't read, you can't recognize people. These are common symptoms, but most people, or many people can remain independent if they're otherwise healthy. <clears throat> now, these days we have this optical coherence tomography, which has been a fantastic advance for us because we can see these microscopic uh, sections of the retina and everyone who comes through. This distance here that I'm showing in the middle here, this is, oh, I thought you could see my arrow. You can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do we have a pointer? Anyway, if you have a look at the top slide here, that thickness is about mm, a third of a millimeter thick. So it's massively magnified. And we can see here a macula with the degeneration along the bottom there in the yellow line. And there's fluid here. There's some swelling under the retina and there's uh, fluid in the retina. So this eye's definitely got an abnormal blood vessel growing in there. They've had three injections of, a, of uh, one of these drugs we use called vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF inhibitors. And after three injections, the whole thing settled down. And no doubt, well, the vision has improved. It was 618, which is only 50% vision. They've gone back to 67.5, which is almost normal vision. Uh, here's another case uh, at baseline. Uh, one week after the injection, frequently it will all go away. The swelling will go away but you have to maintain these people because we don't know when it's safe to stop treatment. So in general, if you start injections for macular degeneration, uh, you're on them for the rest of your life, at least in Australia. In other parts of the world, in the Europe and uh, yeah, the United States, they do try to stop them, but we have not done that in Australia and we do get the best results. What about dry macular degeneration? <clears throat> this is something that uh, we're still working on. Uh, if we have a look at the age-related eye disease study, or AREDS, this is where the vitamins came from. The vitamins come in many forms. It's Macavision, Macutech. There's many, many formulations of this, but basically it all comes from this study. They have a very specific formulation and a very specific indication. So it's broken up here into various categories, but basically there is mild, moderate, and severe. And severe is where you lost vision. Mild is uh, just a few drusen and not much loss of vision. Moderate is where you have a risk of vision loss, but you may not have lost the vision yet. In these cases, they're the ones that these supplements can help with. And at five years in the AREDS study, the patients receiving the supplements had a risk of developing advanced disease, in other words, losing vision, dropped from 28% to 20%. So it's about a 30% uh, reduction in the risk of losing vision in patient, patients with moderate age-related macular degeneration in each eye. It's, uh, they reduced their risk of progressing to advanced by that 30%. And also, the major effect appears to be on stopping people getting the bleeding. It doesn't appear very effective in stopping people getting the atrophy. And if they've got the atrophy, there's no information of whether it's beneficial or not. The main benefit is people with moderate AMD preventing them starting to bleed. And uh, most people believe that that's the case and the risk is about a 40% reduction in that. So the, the take-home message is that they don't work for people with a family history unless you, they have moderate macular degeneration. And people with early macular degeneration were studied in this study. There were a couple of thousand of them. 
and there was no benefit. And you have to remember that antioxidants are not such a bad thing. Oh, no, they're not, not necessarily such a good thing, I should say, when it comes to things like cancers, because the body destroys cancers using oxidants. Now, this hasn't been shown, but overuse of antioxidants may increase the risk of cancer a bit. I don't want to be the boogeyman, but essentially you should use it when you're told by your eye doctor or your optometrist that you have moderate AMD and you're trying to prevent that going advanced. So then there was AREDS2, which was the next one. Uh, there's, there's only two, so uh, it, uh, you don't have to concentrate much longer to get the full message on uh, the Macavision Plus or any of the other plus, the lutein plus, they added lutein and zeaxanthin, which are antioxidants which are uh, in the macula, and they also added fish oil supplement in this study. The fish oil did nothing. So uh, take it by all means to reduce your risk of dying from a heart attack, but it's not going to stop you going blind. Um, there was a small benefit of the, this macavision plus or lutein plus, but only in the patients who didn't eat their leafy green vegetables. So if you have a good diet of leafy green vegetables, then you don't need to use the lutein plus. There is no benefit there. So this is a Macuvision plus formulation, and it's a very commonly used formulation. They're all a variation on that. And Blackmores is not the only distributor. So here's something that you can use to test your vision if uh, you have uh, intermediate or moderate macular degeneration, you're at risk of developing the bleeding and you're testing the eye once a week. I think it's good enough to look at the newspaper, but if you get this angular grid, this is a very sensitive way to find metamorphopsia or distortion. And you do that in one eye or the other, and if you see this sign, there's something going on in the macula that the eye you're looking at this chart with, and you need to have it checked out within a week. Macular degeneration, that's what it looks like. Uh, you can't see centrally, you can see around it. So the management of macular degeneration, we used to do laser treatments, we've stopped doing that now. We use the VEGF inhibitors. Here's another case here. Uh, this may not look much to you, but that red dot in the middle there, if you can see it, that's a bit of blood there. This eye almost certainly has wet age-related macular degeneration. So we're going to start treatment with one of these VEGF inhibitors, Avastin, Lucentis Nilea. Our research suggests that there's no big difference between the three drugs in terms of their efficacy. <clears throat> and here's someone who's had a bigger bleed. This is what it looks like on the OCT. There's a lot of swelling under the retina here. We start treatment, it's come down a bit. Uh, two injections now. We generally start off with monthly injections until it settles and then we treat less frequently. And then after five months, the whole thing settled down. So, in general, um, uh, we have uh, two advanced forms of age-related macular degeneration. We have the dry form and the wet form. Now, I know a lot of people are interested. I do have some other slides sort of on some researches being done, which I could flick through, but there are no treatments for dry age-related macular degeneration which will even prevent it slowly enlarging when it's established or making the macula come back once it's lost. There are many, many clinical trials going on at the moment. Uh, if you want to participate, if you go to your optometrist uh, or your uh, ophthalmologist and ask to be referred to the uh, clinical trial centre at the eye hospital, that's the unit we run there, we have a lot of patients with established macular atrophy and we're trying to stop it getting bigger and bigger and growing into the centre. We're currently running two or three trials, but nearly half a dozen trials have failed so far. And each one of these costs about half a billion dollars. So there's a big, big international effort by drug companies to find an effective treatment. It's likely we'll get something at the moment, but these advances are incremental at the moment. And then with the neovascular macular degeneration, the bleeding, the main problem there is we've got good treatments. We just have to give them so often. Uh, and so for this, we have um, new agents are becoming available, which last twice as long, and they are developing these indwelling systems where you don't have to do injections in the eye. You just connect a reservoir and just fill that up every six months or so, and that continuously provides drug into the eye. 
So just to show you something of uh, a bit of interest in the last five minutes, this is some research being done by Matt Simunovic in our department on optogenetics. So what this does is uh, it, when you have macular disease or retinal disease, Many of the diseases only affect the outer retina. So on this diagram here, the, the, uh, the third one from the top, that's the normal retina. And the big blue layer there, that's where all the photoreceptors are. So the bottom here is an eye with retinitis pigmentosa or macular atrophy. All the photoreceptors gone, but the inner retina is still there. And that's still connected to the brain. So if you can put... Um, light sensitive channels into the inner retina, you may get the retina working again. And this is what optogenetics does. That's how the photoreceptors sees. They have light sensitive channels which are uh, flicked by photons of light. So what we do is we have these uh, cell membranes along the top there and you put these are light sensitive channels which when a, a photon hits them, they will send off an electrical impulse and that gives the, the, the signal of light. We do this on mice running around in the cage and we give them stimuli which they will freeze if they can see it, but if they don't see it, they just go on roaming around the place. And so we have uh, a certain uh, type of uh, a protein called channel rhodopsin, which is very similar to the human one in photoreceptors. And we've inserted this into the inner retina of these mice here, which have lost their outer retina. And we know it's there because we've tagged it with a green protein. So if the retina goes green, it has uh, the, the, the light sensitive protein has been put in there. And this is the electrophysiology. So every flicker of light, this is from these mice that were previously blind, they're, they're actually, the electrophysiology is quite good. Each of those is seeing, is seeing little flashes of light. This is what we think they're seeing. So from a single point, it's a bit amorphous. So we're not sure about the quality of the image yet. Uh, it probably isn't very good to start with. It's going to need improving like all these things, but it's a start. And basically these graphs show that the mice that had the uh, channel rhodopsin did freeze when they were presented with this looming stimulus, whereas the uh, mice that were untreated, uh, they kept on running around and didn't notice anything. And this slide here actually is not all that interesting perhaps, but in... Uh, uh, immediately, but these are human retinas now which have been excised from people at retinal surgery and we've tried to insert these light sensitive proteins in the human retina uh, cells and on the right there where it says RCC, these little green faint dots there, that's the channel rhodopsin proteins in the human uh, uh, inner retinal cells. So this is proof of concept we can get this stuff in and uh, there's quite a bit further research to do before we can get this into the clinic. Just to finish up with, uh, the other thing that we can do now is that we can take somebody's hair follicle or a little skin biopsy and from that we can make a stem cell, which is something the Japanese invented about uh, 14 years ago and you can make stem cells from anybody and from these stem cells you can make anything and you can make a retina. So we do this in our lab now, these are retinal organoids and here you have all these uh, markers of what a retina looks like in particular, this opsin in red in the middle there, that's the light sensitive protein in human cells. So these cells express all the normal photos, these organoids, they express all the, 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 the normal proteins and all the normal cells in the right order, but nobody has worked out how to get them to incorporate in the eyes with say geographic atrophy or macular atrophy and connect up with the brain. It's like half your uh, house sort of fell off the cliff and the repair people just came along with all the wires and the pipes and the bricks and they put them at your back door, it's not going to get you very far. We still need to go the next step and work out how to incorporate these organoids into human retinas so they connect back up with the brain and can start seeing light again. And there's a lot of people around the world doing this research as well. So there, uh, there's some basic messages, which is to do the things that Alina told you about, eat the right foods, um, stay healthy is good for you and uh, check your vision from time to time. Start getting checks when you're 50 if there's a, a family history. Uh, if you have the uh, bleeding, 
or you develop any untoward symptoms and you're at risk, you should see an eye health person earlier rather than later, preferably within one week. And if you have the other conditions we can't treat, there is hope that something will come over the next few years. We'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. So I'll just ask our four guest speakers to please join us in the front here. Just give people a chance to get settled. Now we do uh, normally have a couple of uh, microphones there so that people can ask a question. I did uh, forget to acknowledge Anne Hadcraft, who's from the Regional Client Services person, who's got the number of brochures up the top there at Vision Australia, so you're certainly welcome. There's still a few left, I'm sure. And I'd like to say thank you to you because you certainly helped my mother enjoy her Daniel Steele with the audio books until she passed and to the people who treat wet, cook, um, wet macula because she survived that very well with her regular injections. So thank you for that. Yes, that's okay. So Michelle, anybody want to put their hand up? Question up? That side, okay. Thank you. Um, I had a, a an eye bleed actually when I when I was going to the gym, and the white of my eyes were sort of. But I didn't lose any vision or anything. I went to the GP, and she said, "Oh, look, that's fairly normal." Uh, any comments on that? Should should I have gone to the ophthalmologist to double check that? What you've had is a is called a subconjunctival hemorrhage. They're quite common. They look terrible and very very frightening, uh, but they're generally not dangerous. So the conditions that I would um, be a little bit concerned about is if you're on anticoagulants because those bleeds can extend beyond the bleed that you can see, and I would get that uh, your blood pressure and your heart rate checked. But generally, they're not sight-threatening or vision-threatening. They just look terrible and they're very frightening. So some people come in, they say that they've um, had a coughing fit or something's raised the pressure uh, in their chest or abdomen and then they've woken up. Or sometimes you just wake up with them in the morning having rubbed your eye overnight and not realising that you've done that. But um, no, that's not, not something that you need to worry about coming to see an ophthalmologist about unless you've got other eye issues uh, or you're on those blood thinners. We talked about glaucoma having a family history. Is uh, macula have that issue besides getting older? <clears throat> Yes, macular degeneration commonly runs in families. It's estimated that approximately 70% of macular degeneration comes from genetic causes. The other 30% is environmental, apart from ageing, uh, and that might be diet and smoking is the strongest environmental one. But the main thing is genetics. People often say they haven't got a family history, but perhaps their parents didn't live into their 80s and they were going to get it, but they never got it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Alina, you mentioned um, Beamer's sunglasses. Is that a brand? I've never heard of that. Have you? Is that a brand like Ray-Bans or something? Um, and, and also, how do you purchase them? And um, what's the approximate cost? And what do you mean by user code WARPA10? It is a brand, unlike Ray-Bans. It's a brand that was designed for maximum protection from UV damage. And it's a brand that um, I co-founded with my colleague, who's a paediatric ophthalmologist. It's a long story and it's a, it's a lecture unto itself. But basically, we're both eye surgeons and mums. And around the world, it's been acknowledged that UV damages eyes, and in particular, kids' eyes. And being mums, we wanted to create something for our own kids. And um, we went, went searching for a product that was maximally protective and we ended up developing our own. 
So there are flyers outside and you can get the flyer and you can have a look at our website and Google us. And the code is if you want to purchase, it'll ask you at the checkout and you can use the code and you'll get a little discount and um, the proceeds will go to Glaucoma Australia. There are different um, models of glasses. So you, they're all under $100. The lenses are valued at $500 because they have um, four components called OptoShield technology, uh, which are UV400, polarised and back surface coated. So it's a very high grade lens, which on the free market you would cost you around $500. And we've managed to get the cost right down to below 100 I think the smallest ones are around 65. But if you go on the website, you can have a look at all of that. Uh, yes, we can prescribe. We can work with your optometrist to get it prescribed, yeah. So if, we, if you email us through the website, um, the details of your optometrist, we can work with them to get your prescription paid. I have um, cataracts in both eyes that don't need treatment yet they're not really affecting my vision but I also have a lot of floaters that are getting progressively worse and I was sent to a specialist to see whether I would needed a vitrectomy to have the vitreous removed some years ago and because my vision was still very functional and still is um, that wasn't necessary. I am concerned that the problem with having the vitreous removed is that the operation may there's a risk of going blind because of the operation and if I did have it should I have should I try to hold off and have the cataracts removed at the same time uh, so uh, vitreous floaters are a very common condition it's an age change in the back of the eye in that area that I showed you that sits behind the lens uh, and before between the lens back of the lens and the retina and it's a natural gel and as you get older that becomes more liquefied and what can happen there is that you get these clumps that then can cast a shadow on the retina so people see them as little blobs moving around in the vision so if you move your eyes it's it sort of jiggles around in the vision and although they're terribly annoying um, once again they're usually not dangerous if they're associated with flashes of light or your vision decreases or when you're looking through that eye if part of the vision is missing which is a scotoma as as mark mentioned before that could indicate a retinal detachment so in that situation we're a little bit more concerned with people who have floaters um, generally surgery is not performed for floaters alone because we're talking about vitrectomy so it's a surgery that's done at the back of the eye that carries a significant risk for a problem that uh, is um, not a dangerous problem. And in terms of cataracts, unfortunately, if your vision, if, if and when you have your cataracts out and your vision improves, you may be even more conscious of having those floaters. Sorry to say. But, um, you know, you get, in, when you have the cataracts out, you'd have them out if you had cataract symptoms. Otherwise, I wouldn't suggest any surgery. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm uh, 82 now. Uh, about six or seven years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, age-related uh, dry macular degeneration. And now what is interesting, the the geographic spread hasn't altered very much, if at all. However, it's impacted a little bit, or rather this is my understanding of it since my last uh, examination. It's impacted on the, the, the fovea. And uh, since this was a rather, I, I went to him because I found my I couldn't read as well as I used to. I've always been using magnifying glasses and magnifying systems for some years now. But even with the, the best local one that I could afford, um, I find now that uh, it's impossible 
for me to, to read a newsprint, for example. Do, do you think this is because it's impacting on the fovea? Have I got the right interpretation? Yes, yes, I think you do. Um, I think you brought up an interesting point. You said, I have age-related macular degeneration, and, and people will often say I have age-related macular degeneration, but there's a, a, enormous degrees of age-related macular degeneration. So early AMD, let's call it, early AMD, might just be a few little crystals. And those people you'd expect to be able to drive and would have actually quite a low risk of loss of vision long term. So it's not necessarily terrifying, but and it's the same with cataract. If you look at someone's lens hard enough, you'll see an opacity which is technically called a cataract. So the main thing is whether this is currently in case of cataract or in macular degeneration, or will it affect your vision in the future? Uh, now, it sounds like you do have advanced disease because you have atrophy, not just dry degeneration. This is, because uh, anything's dry degeneration if it's not bleeding. But if you have atrophy, uh, then that is advanced disease. And the fovea that you speak of is the critical structure at the very center of the macula. And yes, if the atrophy spreads into the fovea, that is when you start to lose vision. It can be right next to the fovea, and you might have just a blind spot that you may not even notice next to the central vision. But yes, once the atrophy grows into the fovea, uh, that, is, um, uh, that will affect your vision. And unfortunately, we can't treat that. And not only can't we treat that, the main aim of treatment that all the trials are trying to identify a, sub a substance which will stop it getting bigger because if we find someone who's got it next to the fovea, but it's not into the fovea, if you could stop that expanding, that would be a very effective treatment. That's what we're currently trying to do. Uh, I'm pretty confident we're going to get, the in the next few years, we'll have an agent that can at least do that, which might have been good for you a couple of years ago. I'm sorry, sir. But perhaps is your other eye seeing reasonably, or is that your better eye? Uh. You know, I've got it in both eyes, and uh, it, excuse me, I can't remember if it was just the one eye that uh, he mentioned to me. You know, this begs another question. I'm sorry to keep you so long. Um, let's say, God forbid, it invades the fovea completely. Yes. Uh, what, how would that present itself to me from, from, a, from a vision point of view? Yes, well, you would lose uh, your ability to read and recognise people are the common symptoms that people talk about, but you'd have to have it in both eyes. Okay. But I, I, I still, look, my, my peripheral vision is, is perfect. Um, so I presume, my, because of that, so I, I, I won't go completely blind, so to speak. That is true, but you may get benefit from uh, vision aids. Yes, okay, correct. Okay, thank you very so much. So we, we can sit with you. Our orthoptist can come out and visit you. Um, you can come into one of our clinics and they'll spend quite a bit of time with you going through different magnification um, and um, equipment that will actually help you use your peripheral vision uh, a whole lot better than you could otherwise without um, optical assistance or magnification aids. So we have a myriad of technology. All of our offices have a retail store where you can go through lots of different types of equipment that I'm sure would be able to find something that would help you. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, unfortunately, I'm mindful of the time there. We've got one more minute before the movies come on. <laughs> but I'd really like to say thank you to our guests this evening. And, and the message from any, you've got glaucoma, family history, please make sure that you see a competent optometrist, ophthalmologist to have your pressures tested. To Vision Australia, I thank you for my mother, my late mother. But everybody got the message that they're here, they're available, and they're here to help you. To Alina and to Mark, I really would like to say thank you for all the work you're doing, and we hope that in the future many of us will get the benefit of their hard work. Our next um, meeting is going to be on May the 6th, which will be a Q&A evening, and we're going to talk about palliative care and medical ethics, uh, important end-of-life issues. So I want to say thank you to Event Cinema. Thank you very much for coming along and please be mindful of, if you're going to visit us, Walpa, hand hygiene is a must. And if you've been travelling, please delay for a couple of weeks. So thank you very much and have a good evening.